Welcome to the Future of Work conference here in Zurich. We are really happy to have you all here. When we first heard about the basic income referendum, which will take place in 32 days here in Switzerland, we were excited about the questions it puts on the table, on the table of discussion. What is the future of work? What is work? What is the future of social security? This debate is not merely Swiss, but international debate. We really have to conduct in the coming years. So, as often, Switzerland goes ahead. And this is why we invited all of you here to be here with us today to discuss future of work, basic income, and much more. And we, the Neopolis Network, are very happy to having found such a good cooperation partner like the Gottlieb Dudweiler Institute, who helped a lot during the preparations and provide us with this gorgeous venue. And we are very thankful uh, for all the other partners, which you can see here. Um, yeah, and now I hand over to the moderator of the day, Dorian Warren. Um, he's a fellow at Roosevelt Institute in the US, and he has got his own television show at MSNBC. Dorian Warren. But for, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Who are you? <laughs> so, yeah. so it, Good question. Yeah. <laughs> Just, I'm Armin. I'm Burius. And my name is Benjamin. Okay, have a great day. <laughs> Good morning, and let's please first thank the three organizers of this conference, Armin, Bo, and Benjamin. Give them a round of applause for bringing us all together. We would not all be here today except for one other very special person who I'm very honored to introduce. Many of you know him. This is Dr. David Boshart, who is the CEO of the Gottlieb Dudweiler Institute for Economic and Social Studies. Please give him a round of applause for hosting us today. <laughs> Dr. Dr. Boss Hart, following high school and a business education, he capped his studies with a PhD from the University of Zurich in philosophy and political theory. He's been involved in communications and marketing consulting, in retailing and in scientific research. He's held a number of positions here, and since 1999, he's been the CEO. He is the author of numerous publications and a speaker at international events around the world, Europe, America, Asia. His expertise is focused on consumption and retailing, management, social change, and political philosophy. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bossart. Thank you, Darren. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here among you. As the first speaker, it's always an open page, so you can say whatever you want, which is great. Um, let me say just how thankful I am that it was possible to just put up this conference within a few weeks. So we were tremendously under pressure. So expect a very special conference. When you look at the mixture of people here, it's unbelievable. Normally, when you have regular conferences, it's always the like-minded people who are together. When you look at the, 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 the participants list, you find very different people, which is good. Which is good. Uh, I'm not talking so much about Switzerland, but rather about our studies we do on digitization, the future of work. I think Professor Frey is then in depth going to talk about uh, what's going on in Switzerland with direct democracy and what are the advantages of this system. Let me, talk, uh, let me start with just a brief overview of what are the key, the official narratives when we look at media, when we discuss, discuss the future of, word, of work. Basically, we are being told that automation is going on, going on. It is like linear extrapolation. Robots and artificial intelligence may take over and make more than 50% of our jobs over the next 20 years. We are going towards the gig economy, no longer the, long, the traditional welfare state, state with employment structures. Jobs on demand are becoming the new normal. Full employment is uh, for less. We will just have a core management team with uh, staff complementing the teams. Large bureaucracies anywhere in governments, in large corporations, are fading away as unaffordable and inefficient. Most employees are starting to work like Uber drivers, as contractors and suppliers. And when you look at the relationship, it's 
really amazing, of course, when you have, have a company like Uber, just to give you a hint of the relation, 160,000 drivers, but only 2,000 fully employed. Or when you look at the fantastic idea like WhatsApp, you have right now 1 billion users. In addition to that, you have 1 billion group users, which is even more interesting. Uh, it's operated in 53 languages, but you only use 57 engineers to operate the whole machine. So you see the progress we make in terms of automation. So liquid work, the unbundling of jobs is coming, traditional corporate structures and leadership models will collapse. Well, but is it true? When you look at history, we always had these questions in the industrial age, and we always could cope with change. So when we are moving now from a world that is linear, one, two, three, four, and at step 30, you're at the figure 30, to a world that is exponential, one, two, four, eight, and at step 30, you're at a billion, you see that we are living in a completely different world. But it's dangerous just to extrapolate that humans are now the biggest enemy of the robots and artificial intelligence. So it might turn out true, of course, that the team, the management team, looks like that. But where is the problem? Man and, man and machine can also become complementary. Men also learn step by step. So when you look at media, when you look at, um, at what's going on, a uh, Hollywood film uh, director recently told me, uh, Jim, uh, James Lima, that we have deeply ingrained pictures of Hollywood movies, of Star Treks, of science fiction movies, and of, um, of all these um, culturally now ingrained patterns of man versus machine. So this is just the old saying, on one side you have the machines and on the other side you have the, male, the, the, the man. But is it true? We can also learn together. These are our friends, not our enemies. So when you look to a very famous novel, The Fear Index by Robert Harris, in theory it might happen that the company of the future has no stuff. The company of the future has no man manager. The company of the future is a digital entity. The company of the future is already alive. But this is linear thinking, extrapolation. We are step by step learning, and the complementarity and the skills, I think, are important. Let me briefly show you in a nutshell what is the biggest difference moving from an industrialized world to a much more digitized world. I just tried to put in a nutshell all and compile all the findings we did with a lot of studies about the digitization at our institute. In a nutshell, we can say, basically, digitization, artificial intelligence means we can do more and more with less and less, like magically. So the old industrial world is now in tension, in a tremendous struggle with the digital world, and this will certainly last for the next 10, 20, 30 years. The old industrial world was based on the idea of scarcity. We don't have enough capital. We don't have enough human resources. But when you look at the digital world, I mentioned WhatsApp, it is abundance. So the thing is, the old world was based on money as the key currency. But the currencies we are developing right now, it's data derived from people, from machines, it's data that comes from things. So it opens a whole new world. We cannot really deal with it right now. But for me, the most fascinating thing is, when you look at the industrial world, the economies of scales, it was always clear, on one side, you have either very expensive products or expensive products and cheap products. And with economies of scales, things became cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. But when you look at what is now regular, what is now the new normal for the young generation, it's no longer expensive versus cheap. It's cheap versus free. WhatsApp is basically for free. You pay with your data, of course. But basically, people take it for granted. You have GPS, you have pictures you can send, you have music you can consume. It is there for free. Look at the music industry. Never ever has been so much music consumed like these days. But when you look at sales, it goes down and down and down. This is the reality. So what do we measure when we measure the wealth, the wealth of the digital economy? The old world was hardware-driven. Huh? All had needed to be physically printed. Now the question is, how is it networked as a service? You don't need to print many things anymore. It's software-driven. 
We are moving away from the old producer logic, where you create large departments, where you create um, a lot of close in internal conflicts, hierarchies and everything. If this work continues, you see that this producer logic is prone to more and more conflicts, massive cost overruns, mounting delays, failed launches, collateral damage, whereas the consumer logic is now gaining momentum and basically we have to address whatever we do to the consumer logic. So we're moving to to towards a total consumer mindset. The old world was about geography and hierarchy, the new world it's about networks and speed. So it is real time, you expect more and more, we measured that, for example, you're standing in line, line you're no longer long waiting time. It must be immediate. So this is not an accident right now that we see the battle in the delivery systems. It must be faster because you expect it now. And this is not going to change. This is even going to accelerate. So to put it in a nutshell, you can say the old world was basically governed by two strong metaphors, the tanker and the silo, whereas the new one, so it's a little bit scary. It's drones and it's cruise missiles. But I think we as human beings, what we have available in terms of, when you look at the applications, what we have in terms of entertainment, in terms of learning power, it is absolutely astonishing, but we do not yet really leverage it because we have this, the wrong measures. When you look at GDP, it doesn't take into consideration what's positively going on. So we not fully understand how we are moving towards a digital world, but it is good when we discuss even the most crazy idea in order to understand where we are going to. The biggest mistake, I think, is when we argue that artificial intelligence is creating a new human. This is the picture we have from the movie industry. But when you look back, we have been 100,000 generations hunter and gatherers. We have been 500 generations within the agriculture world. We have been 10 generations in the industrial world and not yet one generation in the digital world. So we're not creating a new human being. Huh? What technology does, it is amplifying the human strength and the human weaknesses. So if we leverage our strength in collaborative skills, in cognitive skills, we win. If we go, and of course you can make many silly things, if we go to our weaknesses, then I think we are all lost. Let me just put a few intriguing questions uh, to complement what I just said. It is not yet sure when we measure traditional GDP, where is growth going to? Because most of the digital development might bring even more deflationary tendencies. So it is not an accident that we have all over the Western world now the issue of secular stagnation. I will not go into that, but you know that, I guess. Um, of course, the welfare state needs redefinition. Well, it is too bureaucratic, it has systems that are no longer affordable. When you look at the US, when you look at the European community, debt levels are rising faster on average than GDP, so it is not a sustainable model to think in old industrial terms. Hans Werner Sinn, the most prominent German economist, said, we are now living in Europe of 28 in a debt union, we are just basically accumulating more debt. Professor Gordon, who wrote the great book about the rise and the, the fall of U.S. productivity and the U.S. growth, he spoke here years before he became famous, which is also a good uh, indicator of how far we are, how, how, uh, how uh, many years we are ahead of what's going on. And he talks about the headwinds in the U.S. He's more positive about Europe than the U.S. He says it's the education system, very important. Um, he talked about climate change, which affects Switzerland not as much, for example, as the U.S., when you look at all the issues that are going on, with hurricanes and drought and all these issues, and inequality. So all these issues are not hitting Switzerland like they're going to hit the United States. My biggest fear is that we are going back, and also just to say basic income might be good in a very well-defined context under very spe specific circumstances. We don't know where Switzerland st will stand 10 years from now, but right now I think it's too early. For me, the fear is that we are going back to old redistribution models deriving from old macroeconomic thinking. And when you talk to, Mac to, to conservatives, they are happy to slash the welfare state. When you talk to, to uh, liberals and left-wing people, of course, they are happy to increase even debt and to increase the, 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 the share of the state and the government in our economies. 
this is not the issue. I think really we have to focus on how we're going to measure the welfare and the wealth of people. I mentioned WhatsApp. It doesn't appear in any statistics. Or take another example, fantastic website platform Udacity, where you can learn and get courses and be trained. A learning platform that gives you half of your money back, half of your fee back when you do not finish the course. It's very interesting because people these days, they quickly quit, they do not finish a course. So if you are willing, have the willpower to finish the course, you are giving back half of the money. I think that's clever. And when you, don't, when you finish the course and do not find a job after a certain lapse of time, you are being paid back the whole amount of your fee. I think these are interesting models. Do they in total add to GDP? It's not yet clear at all. I think the biggest challenge lies not in the well-defined economies in Asia and in Europe. For me, the biggest challenge will, will uh, happen in the, in the, in the uh, emerging economies, where we might have leapfrogging when you look at 3D printing, when you look at the skills, when you look at the pathways we went through from property rights change in the agriculture, then we have modest and decent manufacturing bases, then high-end consumer electronics, then we opened the financial markets. When you look at other countries than, let's say, China, South Korea, who are those who still can go through these paths? So leapfrogging might mean what um, Danny Roddick called premature disindustrialization. This might be the real challenge, because the global GDP is all calculated about the continuously uh, uh, um, increasing number of middle-class people. But is it happening? We don't know yet. We went through all the phases here in Switzerland. We have a well-established education system. But will it prevail? We don't know. Will it still be this uh, pattern? So where do we start to create reliable work? To be very brief on that, for me it is clear. It boils down to the question, what is the human being? What is your conviction about? How can we learn? We know we are quite inert. We are cognitive misers, we tend to be lazy. But the point is, what is the political culture? And I think that when we listen to Professor Fry, political culture, the system of apprenticeship, the dual learning system, is sort of a cornerstone that is also able to create a prosperous future for the many and for a whole country. As I said, emotionally we are still hunter and gatherers with medieval institutions. An industrial mindset that is completely uh, dependent on growth, traditional GDP. We are now leaving all with godlike devices, and it increases people's expectations everywhere. What basically the iPhone did to all of us, everybody on planet Earth has now higher expectations. When you look at the younger generation, they have very high expectations about jobs, about their lives. When I look at my generation, it was quite a step-by-step -step approach, completely different. This is the digital world that immediately increases expectations of people. We must understand that we are not basically consumers, we are basically doers. Huh? When you look back, hunter and gatherers, we derive happiness from hunting, we derive happiness from gaming, we derive happiness from rivalry with peers in a competitive environment. We are doers, we are not lazy. When someone says he's retired these days, I think it's a dangerous notion. What will we do in the future? I think it will be how we complement the machine and how we work together. Let me finish with a few notes about where is work going to and what are the most important issues. A great book from uh, McCluskey, Larry McCluskey, University of Chicago, says that the quality of work is going to change. It's more about conversation quality and the mind design. Who has influencing and persuasive power? I think that's brutally true. Who can influence others is the most important, because it's the mind. It's the battle about what ideas do you have? What ideas of what expectations do you have? So the work we do will be more and more about decisions and persuading others to agree, change minds, and less and less about the implementation of anything physical. Of course, you might also argue, and I 100% agree, we will see more propaganda. Look at China, 
look at Turkey, look even at the Western world, prop Russia. The propaganda has become an instrument to influence people more and more. What do we need? First of all, I think we need different skills and not just money. So it is the battle of the mind of people. And here we have a lot of research already uh, going on. Also what we do with the Global Thought Leaders Index, we can measure who can influence others. It is much more about collective intelligence, how we bring together people that solve uh, the right people together that solve problems and not just individually organized intelligence. So collective intelligence means how is a certain community prepared to share ideas, to develop their knowledge and to, to develop their, their, uh, their insights. I think this again is the great advantage of Switzerland with our dual uh, apprenticeship system, with the education system. We have high control in a small country, social control. We know about what really is the problem of people. We don't have these large bureaucracies that are abstract and not really taking control of people. We also have in Switzerland the healthiest retired population on earth. We found out in other studies, if you kick them, if you nudge them, they are happy to volunteer, they are happy to contribute, which is a tremendous potential. So it is about the community, and it is about sharing insights, and it is about sharing uh, sharing intelligence. As our machines are becoming more intelligent, we also have to improve our insight. So without basic understanding of the digital economy, our economy might not thrive. And again, we already have a lot of uh, studies about that. We know who can influence others. We do, together with the Bergruen Institute and the World Post on an annual basis, the Global Thought Leaders Index, we can now measure exactly who has influencing power over others, so we can see who are the thought leaders. And I think if we can capitalize that, we are fast, because when we see who are the thought leaders in new social, social policy making, you can create a network and immediately influence others. We now cover the languages like English, Spanish, Mandarin, German, and this year we will also include the Arab world, so we will understand who are the thought leaders there. Last page, prevailing questions, approaches for the next decade. First of all, what do we measure? What do we take into consideration? All the GDP measurements are not appropriate to measure our coming wealth and our coming income situation appropriately. We must focus first on who is connected to him, whom, because when you are connected to the right people, you are fast, you can change fast. We can measure that all. Skills predict skills, I think that's important. When you have already a fully developed skill basis, you can develop skills and it's easy to predict, for example, in the Western world, also in Asia, who are going to be the nations that are doing a good job and who not. Let me be a little bit provocative. The biggest danger I see globally is not the machines, it's stupidity. This is the biggest danger. The great US-American philosopher Hubert Dreyfus said many decades ago regarding intelligent machines, artificial intelligence, he said, no, the biggest danger is not super-intelligent machines. The biggest danger is sub-intelligent men. This is the point that we have to work on. And when you look globally, education of people, giving them access to job, giving them self-esteem, Giving them recognition among peers is the most important. Money is good for the hygienic reason, but just distribu distributing money won't help in most of the cases, as far as I know. So globally, when we look, the threat is coming from a very young, a very male, never ever the female is never the problem, it's always the male. The male, the young, the uneducated, the jobless, and the stupid. Huh? They are going to ISIS, they are going to be extremists. So the real power is, give the young generation access to something that is really good and that helps them to understand that they are valuable to society. This is my short introduction. I hope this lays a little bit the ground to further discussions. I'm happy now to pass on to the moderator again. Thanks. Thanks very much for coming. <laughs>